welcome to the Creating Powerful Impact podcast, where we look at behind the scenes of why and how leaders are making an impact and how you can too. I'm Shay Wheat, the founder and CEO of Grace and Ease Productions and the host of Creating Powerful Impact podcast. We support six, seven, and eight-figure speakers, coaches, and expert thought leaders in creating powerful and profitable live and virtual live events. Our clients have made over $25 million in revenue, gained over 3,700 new clients, and changed the lives of over 29,000 attendees with events as few as 50 people and over 4,000 in attendance. So stick around to the end of the show where we'll reveal how you can be a next guest in just 15 to 20 minutes. Welcome, welcome to another episode of Powerful Impact. Today, I have somebody extremely, extremely important to share with you. This individual, the amazing Elizabeth Solaru, is a multi-award winning founder of Luxury Business Emporium. Now get this, Elizabeth is a former scientist, a headhunter, a luxury cake maker, and now she shares her expertise as a luxury business coach and consultant. Her work has been featured in numerous national and international blogs, publications, and TV, including Vogue, The Telegraph, The BBC, The Good Food Channel, and Sky Living, just to name a few. Also, her clients include British, European, and Middle Eastern royalty, celebrities, and high net worth individuals. On top of that, her cakes have also been and have also been featured and appeared in films such as My Best Friend's Wedding by Sony Columbia Pictures. How freaking cool is that? <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys, like she like she's doing all of this and in addition to that, she's also an advocate of maternal health and actively fundraises for Jeans for Jeans charity. Please help me welcome to the Creating Powerful Impact stage Elizabeth Solaru. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Wonderful. I'm so excited to have a luxury business expert on with us today. And on top of that, I just want to say congratulations for being named one of the world's masterful 100, which for those of you that aren't aware, this is actually a list of the most successful, um, excellent, masterful luxury experts and brands in their field. So congratulations on that honor. Thank you so much. That was such a shock to me because I didn't, I wasn't aware of it and I just got contacted and um, it was such an honor. I could not believe it. Yay. Well, I mean, you're doing some pretty amazing things and I'm really excited to, you know, dive in today because, you know, I'm sure some people are like, okay, she's like freaking rocking it and she's like brilliant and everything that she does. But I know you really connect with people on regardless of their background they can really learn to set up and run high-end businesses and attract high-end clients. So I definitely want to make sure that we touch on that. But before we do, is there anything that you would like to add um, or talk about how you're continuing to create impact in the world today? Uh, Yes, Um, it's fantastic to have done all that. But for me, it's about how do we make the world a better place? Because your impact can be positive or negative. And I truly, truly believe that in our own little way, we can all all make a positive impact. So for me, that's why I advocate for maternal health, Mm. both physically and mentally. And particularly as a woman of color, I know that in parts of the world still, we are five times more likely to die in childbirth, to um, have medical issues, et cetera, et cetera. So there's um, a piece around fundraising. There's a piece around scientific research and there's a piece around awareness as well. And there's also a piece around advocacy, Mm -hmm. but it's all done in a holistic way, in a way that includes everybody because where we're only as strong as the least amongst us. I've always believed that. So 
you know, my neighbor's problem is my problem. So that's why I'm very, very passionate about that. Mm. Um, also, as a scientist, I used to work for Great Ormond Street Hospital, which was one of the best children's hospitals in the world. And I was there when Jeans for Jeans was created. So I kind of feel in my heart, it's one of my, it's a heart thing for me. So that's why. And in fact, in um, February of uh, this month, uh, we're actually doing 40 squats a day to raise funds. <laughs> So those are the things I'm very passionate about. Yeah. Well, okay. So you'll have to give us like, is there a link or something we can add it to the show notes for people to get involved for jeans for jeans and, and definitely get the word out. I love, I love all of like the visionaries and the experts that we get to bring on. Um, and even some of our clients who then have like a passion project. Yeah. So we incorporate that into like their live events or their virtual live events. So much so like one of our clients, she loves the ocean and she was just like dumbstruck how much trash is in the ocean. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so as a part of her event, we ended up raising enough money to take nine golden gate bridges full of trash out Whoa. of the ocean. Right. Wow. Oh my goodness. Yes. Oh my yeah. goodness. Like, that is now that's real impact. That's impact, <laughs> right? And yeah. utilizing stages like podcast or hosting your own events or whatever, speaking on other people's stages. That's how we can go ahead and create that impact in the world, which I absolutely love. So please make sure that you get us the link so we can include it in the show notes um, and connect you with more people that are also interested in the same causes. That's that would be amazing. That's great. Okay. Huh? Thank you. So let's dive into a little bit about luxury brands, high-end clients. How in the world do we start attracting high-end clients? That's a very good question, actually. So I always start with you as an individual, you then your business, but more importantly, putting your client in the center. So I happen to fall into the luxury space. I, as I was a scientist, I was a headhunter, but I wasn't really in the luxury space, but I started creating my products. And I remember somebody saying to me, your products are high-end products. I didn't even know what that meant, mm. but I found that naturally these clients were coming to me. And then I got curious because there's something about a scientist, you get curious about your environment. And I was thinking, okay, these people coming to me, um, they seemed different on the on the out on the outside on the surface, but there were certain commonalities and there were certain differences. So I then did something a little bit experimental. I looked back at all my emails, my client list, and I started grouping my clients into different types. Hmm. And I and the, I did that because I was thinking, you know, this person is similar to that person is similar to that person. But these are the differences. So I kind of made notes of that informally over the years to the point where even from somebody's email or somebody's um, tone, I can tell where they fell into. Now, this is not me typecasting or putting people into a box. This is just looking at their characteristics. Yeah. And then I came out with five different types of luxury clients. Okay. So, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I'll just do a quick headline. So yeah. number one, number one, you have your aspirationals. So your aspirationals are, they're not quite there yet, but they're on their way there. Your aspirationals are about probably the largest group in terms of luxury clients. So they um, have people they idolize, they've got people they look up to, and they can be drawn from any class of people. And in that group, you would find the most diversity. So if you're looking to expand your business, if you're looking to bring in other types of client, look at the aspirationals, and they have certain characteristics. And there are four types under aspirationals four types. So then let's move to the next type. The next type is what I call the know and shows. So they know all about brands. They, they've done their homework. They want um, the best. I call them know, know and shows or simply the best. You have got to have, you've got to be the best in your field to work with them. 
So if you want to work with somebody like that, you need to use words like we are the best. So it's not a matter of we may be, you have to be so confident and you've got to give them that confidence because a lot of people feel that such clients are all about the show, but not necessarily because to them, being able to get the best is proof and it validates something inside them. It makes them feel I'm going for the best. Therefore, I have an expectation of the highest possible quality. So you've got the simply the best or the no one shows. And they do like to talk about. And how do you know them? Because they'll tell you, um, I got this from Chanel. It's the best bag in the range. There's only two of it in the world. There's only three of that in the world. You know, they will tell you. So it's about active listening when it comes to people like that. The I third, love that. So it's like you're you're listening to what it is that they're telling what you is, they're in telling order to be like, oh, okay, this is where they're this at. Is where, this is where you probably might belong to. Because And remember, yep. because we're human, it's a lot more complicated than that. So you might have a high element of um, simply the best and have a little bit of something else. So let's move on to the something else. So type number three. three. Yep. Um, type number three are the aesthetics. It's all about the look, but it's a lot deeper than that. So your aesthetically driven person, mm -hmm. it's how it's how they file information. So it's not necessarily just about how things look. It's how they see the world. They like order. They like things lined up. They like straight lines or curves. They like clean lines. Mm -hmm. Even the way they dress, even when they enter a room, the first thing their eye is drawn to is either something that's slightly askew. Even if the chair they sit on, they will sit on a chair that looks amazing, not necessarily the most comfortable chair. So you need to be aware of that. And their professions tend to give them away. So they tend to be interior designers, architects. They tend to be stylists. And again, under aesthetics, there are different types. Mm -hmm. different types of aesthetics about I think I, na I named about five or seven and the reason I'm doing this is because I'm doing a book um so I'm actually putting all this in a book anyway thank um, goodness <laughs> yeah I'm putting all this in a book um the fourth type um that I identified is what I call safety first or comfort first mm. your safety first for lack of a better word will be your old money so to them, it's not about the money it, it, it's per se, although they're aware of value to them because they grew up surrounded by comfort, not necessarily. And we're talking about wealth here, not rich, but we're talking about wealth. So and the irony is that they might have the most shabby houses, but they're very old houses the furniture is not brand new. There's a joke in the UK that people like that don't buy furniture. They inherit their furniture. So you've got your, and it's all about comfort. Now for them, trust is absolutely more than anything. You may not have the best product in the world, but if they trust you and they know you're not going to blab and you are discreet, you they'll you know they'll buy from you for life having said that with that sort of um set of people once you are out you are out Ooh, they can drop yeah. you like that tomorrow so Can't get once, that trust back right You've it's lost not just, it. it's not just about trust it's about um with them it's about because some of them and again there are seven different types under that some of them like collecting people they love curating people because they find that interesting. It's, it amuses them. So you may be part of the collection today. You may not be part of the collection tomorrow. So you need to be aware of that. And you need to be aware that in terms of social standing, you may not necessarily, I mean, we're all equal, don't get me wrong, but you may not necessarily, because you're not of that world, you will not be perceived as an equal. And I know this may offend people, but however, this is how some people in that world, that's how they think and that's how they are. Yes. So you need to be very much aware of the fact that you are a supplier, a provider. 
in that world again there's one particular thing that they have they have gatekeepers so there's a gatekeeper there's a housekeeper or somebody or another who is there to protect them because sadly many people want to get to know them either for their money their name um like social celebrity contact, status, yeah. celebrity status, whatever it is. So they have to be extra, extra careful. So that's where the trust, the little bit of paranoia or whatever it is, that's where it comes in. So again, we talk about the role of the gatekeeper, etc. in my book. And then um, the last one, now I'm trying to remember number five, the last one would be, and I put them in a certain category, in a different category, would be Gen Z's and millennials so your gen z's and millennials they're, they're in a different category although they might have um certain similarities with the other four that i mentioned the reason i put the gen z's and millennials in a different category is because they have actually turned the luxury world upside down the way they consume luxury is different they, I call them the, this is not going to work for me generation. So they're, they're the first generation to, you employ them and they will say, these hours are not going to work for me. Yeah. We, I mean, my generation, I'm a Gen X. I wouldn't even dare to think about that. <laughs> I wouldn't even, I mean, to me getting a job, I'll be grateful on my knees saying thank you to my employer. But they're more like, um, they have this autonomy, the social power, to say, no, actually, this is not going to serve me. Mm -hmm. And the way they look at luxury is completely different because they're not, they're not all about, I mean, I know people say a lot about, oh, they like shiny things, et cetera, et cetera. But no, they, they feel very deeply about the environment. They feel very deeply about world affairs. Um, they grew up um, as um, a te technological natives, um, I'm an immigrant, technological immigrant, but they grew up with these devices welded to their palms. So how they view things are completely different. Yeah. And whereas in my generation, I probably had a paper round. I woke up at five o'clock in the morning. I'll do a paper round, then go to school. They can lie in bed till 10 and make more money in one hour than I would in a month of doing a paper round. Mm -hmm. So they got money, um, some, the, the luxury uh, uh, uh uh, Gen Z's and the luxury millennials, they made money earlier and quicker. And the way they spend that money is different. Mm -hmm. The way, and also what they prioritize and what they buy is different. And because of them, the pre loved and secondhand luxury goods market is actually booming. And right now, 60% of a lot of um, luxury goods sales is to Gen Z's and millennials. So they are a very, very important group. So I think that's roughly, I mean, I know I've left a couple out, but yeah. that's roughly the different categories. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel it's really important, you know, for our audience to be like, okay, if I'm looking at my product and service and who is my avatar, who is my ideal client, who's my, you know, who's that person, who's my dot, if I'm aiming at, at a bullseye. And if you're wanting to, you know, have a luxury high-end client, it's good to know, are you looking for the aspirational ones, the know and show, the, you know, um, Gen Z or the safety first? You know, it, I feel it would be really important because then you're crafting all of your marketing, all of your messaging, all of your branding, all of your imagery to that audience. And knowing who they are, it, I think that alone is just kind of like a mic drop moment to look at it from your perspective in the luxury space. Absolutely. And this is and it's really weird because I I I love books. I read yeah. books and I've read a lot of marketing books. I mean, there are some luxury strategy books that are classics. Amazing, amazing. Then I noticed one thing. I'm like, why is no one talking about the client why is literally yes. nobody and I thought am I onto something or am I crazy here so I kind of so this is something I've been looking at I mean, in great detail like I said I'm writing a book about it and the, the more I dive in and also because I've actually done it um I, my clients are really high-end clients 
um, even some of the uh, consultancies I've done, the stages I've spoken at. When I tell, when I share these insights, they're like, whoa, we never thought of that before. Because for me, as you rightly said, I draft my products with the end user in mind, which is a client. Right. So for me, for example, my favorite client is actually the safety first. Um, that, that's my favorite client. My, my trickier clients um, tend to be the aesthetically driven ones or um, the one I left out, the innovator, because there's an innovator category. They're all about something different, something new. And initially they seem very unstable. They're the ones who change their minds every five minutes. They're the ones who think of a new idea. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. However, as tricky as they are, your new products are going to come from them. Your new ideas for your business are actually going to come from them. So if you can keep them happy, you can keep anybody happy. Mm -hmm. So I have another theory as well that if you look at how banks operate or hotels, how they operate, very simple products. So a five-star hotel or a bank, um, or they, they have an, you know, you go there, you open an account, money comes in, money goes out. That's it. Very simple model. However, your bank will have accounts for students, account for pensioners, accounts for um, uh, investors, accounts for uh, ordinary, you know, workers, etc. Um, so they have Maybe different for Christmas and yeah. for Christmas, exactly. So they've got different products. So I believe that as a luxury business, you can do the same as well. So you can have your messaging. It doesn't have to be one messaging. You can create two or three avatars of whom you want to serve, and then certain products you aim them at certain avatars mm -hmm. of luxury clients so that's the theory anyway but also there's a bit more to it because this is where the complication sets in what kind of business what kind of luxury business are you and again there are about five different types of luxury businesses that you could possibly be so I'm not going to take up too much time with that I'm going to leave you in suspense <laughs> <laughs> oh man but, no that's that's fascinating so, i love so, that so, so what you then do is if you okay me as a if i'm a certain type of luxury business maybe my business will serve aspirationals the best or maybe i will serve you know, so for example just you know so i tease you a little bit okay. if, you, if you are a heritage brand for example so i call heritage brand um maybe you are set up um, there's a famous um, food store in London called Fortnum and Mason. So Fortnum and Mason heritage brand set up in 17 something, 16 something. I can't re I can't remember. And they sell gourmet food, gourmet, this, that, the other. Very nice, lovely, lovely stuff. You know, beautiful packaging, excellent service. I mean, the in my mind, one of the best service, you know, in terms of retail now, a, a, a store like that is suited to your safety first and your comfort first. Mm -hmm. Because heritage speaks to heritage, right? That makes sense. Yeah, it does. Well, and I mean, knowing that, who yeah. then can possibly become one of your JV partners, right? One of your joint venture partners or people, That's correct. That, you know, it's like, where do your clients hang out? You would bump into your heritage people there, right? Your safety first people at those locations. So it, it's brilliant just to be like, okay, who is the brand already serving? That's correct. That's where I can find more of my, my leads, my potential clients. You've got it in one. Absolutely. It's, I, as I say, um, business is not that complicated. It's very simple. People buy, people sell. Yeah. It's humans. It's us. You know, it's the interaction that makes it a bit more complicated. But if you break it down into, okay, certain types, you know, and then you do the bit of mapping. I suppose this is where the scientist in me comes in. Mm -hmm. This is where you get the aha moment, like, wow. So that's why I'm truly excited to be on a podcast like this, to share to talk about, you know, my upcoming book, et cetera, because I believe that people out there who are struggling, even if you don't want to necessarily attract um, high-end clients or luxury clients or whatever, but you want to level up your business and you want a better paying client, 
I believe that this could really, really serve you well. Absolutely. Yeah. You could take the same teachings and, and put it with anything, right? Whether it's luxury, it's not. And they could essentially map out their own. Who's coming in? Go through the same process that you did. Who yeah. am I attracting? What, what am I seeing are similarities with the clients that I have currently? Who was my favorite client? Who was my not so favorite client? And then see what it looks like and go, how do I get more of this particular client that I absolutely love being with? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And then it, it might require that um, because I, I do things when I consult, I do things called luxury audits. So, again, it's about being and, and you've got to be very honest and very objective because you can't serve um, everybody or you may not even be in a position to serve the people you want to serve because the way they view your business mm. might be different to way the way because I say to people, there's a difference between what you sell and what people buy from you. Yeah. So I, so you need to ask your clients, when you came to me, what, what did you think you were buying? Because you might think, oh my, for example, I thought I was selling beautiful looking cakes and, you know, and that makes sense to me. Yeah. But what, but what people were buying was not cake. People were buying the dream. People were buying, um, something unique they were buying an experience so what they were buying from me was completely different to what I thought I was selling so mm -hmm. that made me think that's so that's the thinking that I believe we need to do if whether you're luxury or not luxury yeah because it goes into the story that you're creating it goes into how you communicate with them it goes into like what is it that they're really longing for yeah. Not what it is like, at least for me, I tend to be like, okay, bullet point. This is what we do, right? This is how you create an event. This is how da, 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 da. But really our clients really could care less about food <laughs> and beverage, about the venue, about who you need to email to do all of these things. They really don't care. Yeah. They yeah. want the experience. They want this outcome. They want to be on stage and be with their people, right? And like, that's what they want. Absolutely. They want that. They want that transformation. Yeah. They want that. They want that transformation. They want to be able to say, I came to your event and my life changed or at your event, I, I had this connection. So for you, it's about transformation, relationship building, connection, community, um, yeah, community, et cetera. It's not necessarily. And half the time, and I know this sounds awful. Half the time, people may not even remember what the speaker said. Yeah. But they remember how they felt. Yeah. They remember that something changed within them. Yeah. But 90% of what the speaker said, they can't, but they will remember one quote or they might remember one action. So again, it's about what are people buying from you as opposed yeah. to what you're selling. Yeah. So, so the time that you were a keynote speaker at the top of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, <laughs> did they remember what you said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, some of them, um, to be, I, I did get a lot of them because as a speaker, I'm, I'm a heart speaker. So I know I had to appeal to, and I also speak with no notes. I know it sounds weird. I, that's my brain. That's my process. I speak without notes. So people remember things like that, which, which I was surprised about. I thought they remember or some fantastic quote or whatever. No, it was like, oh my God, you know, 45 minutes, no notes. And you spoke about this and you spoke about that. Um, again, it's about, for me, it's about the heart. Yeah. It's about engaging the heart and also getting people to see things differently. Um, again, I have another memorable experience when I spoke in Florence um, and I spoke about NFTs in, in the luxury space. Mm. A lot of people in the audience couldn't care less about NFTs. They honestly could not. But when I began to say to them, this is how NFTs can make you money. This is what people would potentially do with your brand if you do not look into it. These are the things. And they were like, whoa, you know, you mean people could do that? And I'm like, it's already happening. Mm -hmm. And recently we had Hermes take an artist to court um, because this artist created digital versions of Hermes bags, mm. um, the working. Um, he created them, covered them in fur, and they sent him a cease and desist. He didn't listen. So they took him to court and they won. But, the, uh, but this is the thing. This is the thing that was shocking. 
people were buying those digital products for about $10,000, $20,000, almost the same as a real handbag. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and so this is, you know, so this is where, um, so when I speak about these things, it's not just the topic, it's more, what, what's the potential impact on your business? Yeah. You know, if you, and also I believe that we're entering a different age now. It's something I felt during the, and again, I'm showing my age, the 2000.com bubble. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Um, the dot-com bubble, when people were like, the um, websites, you know, the internet's going to change our lives. going to drink. <laughs> exactly. But now we're entering into another technological age. Again, um, because of the pandemic, things moved a lot faster in terms of technology. So it's about things like that, that we need to look at and the impact on our businesses. Mm. So, so many good things. Um, and unfortunately, we do have to kind of wrap up, but I would love for you to, you know, share what is the best way that people can stay in touch with you? I know you started to talk about, you know, the five ways to, to have your high-end clients and the different types of, of high-end clients, um, but what's the best way they can, they can stay in touch with you? And do you have a little free gift for us? Um, yes. And um, I know that you said you would kindly drop it in the show notes. I have a little gift, a PDF, five ways to find high end clients. So five ways you can find them. Um, it's all in there. It's not it's not a huge document. So you can get through it because I'm pretty straightforward. I get to the point. So I will share that link with you. Um in the show uh, notes we'll definitely the put notes, the yeah. link there exactly, and then yeah. definitely people can also just stay in touch with you on your website on my website uh, contact me you can um uh, drop me an email my email address is there or you can actually whatsapp us as well we have a business whatsapp again this is how people you know tend to uh contact people nowadays they have gone other days well, you've got to email me or call now you can whatsapp etc so That's yeah hard. i'll be delighted to hear from you yeah so definitely take a look at luxurybusinessemporium.com again we'll put all of the links in the show notes but i just want to say thank you so much for being with us today elizabeth um, a wealth of knowledge. I had some ahas, some notes that I've started to take, and um, I'm excited for people to stay connected with you as well. Before we let you back into the rest of your day, is there anything you'd like to leave us with? Um, yes, I would love, um, again, this show in particular. First, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. And the second thing is about impact. Um, whatever we do, um, I would love for us to be, you know, be very conscious of the impact that we leave. I have a couple of passion projects. I'm very passionate about maternal health, both physically and mentally. And this is something that um, I've, it, it's very personal to me. So again, it's about no, uh, uh, making a contribution and an impact that helps some, you know, somebody else. Um, so for me, that's absolutely important. And I do fundraise for Jeans for Jeans as well. So again, this month we are doing 40 squats a day to raise funds for Jeans for Jeans. Again, I will send you the link for that. So that would really, really help. So those are the two things I'd like to leave you with. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks for everybody joining us today for another episode of Creating Powerful Impact. Look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to the Creating Powerful Impact podcast. If you are a successful coach, speaker, author, or thought leader who would like to be on this program, simply visit creatingpowerfulimpact.com forward slash guest. If you are someone who got something out of this interview, would you please do me a favor and share this episode on social media? Just do a quick screenshot with your phone and text it to a friend or post it on your socials. Also, if you know somebody that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag creating powerful impact. I love seeing all of your posts and great guest selections. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content to make sure you don't miss any episodes. Go ahead and subscribe. 
Your thumbs up ratings and reviews go a long way to help promote the show, and they really mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more about us? Head on over to our website, raceandeaseproductions.com, or follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram. Just look for Grace and Ease Productions on your favorite platform. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.